Hello, welcome to Cinema Savvy. I'm Chris, and the video you're about to see is an interview that I had a couple of days ago with Kevin Derrick, who is the director of More Than Miyagi, The Pat Morita Story. It's his latest documentary film. It's available on video on demand, and you can also pick up the DVD and Blu-ray from the official website as well. Um, we actually covered a review of this documentary a few days ago. We were very fortunate enough to be given a screener of the film. Uh, both me and George, who covered that, absolutely loved this documentary. So it was a great opportunity to sit down with the director himself and get a bit more background information on his process, the documentary itself, and maybe some other things that we didn't know too. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview as much as I did. I'm going to play a quick clip from the trailer of More Than Miyagi before heading into the actual interview itself. Pat Morita. Mr. Pat Morita. Oh, yeah. Pat Morita, ladies and gentlemen. Lenny Bruce's mother named him the hip nip, but he hung on because now all of a sudden he had an angle. He would tend to do the same show over again, <laughs> and then he couldn't figure out why he wasn't getting laughs. Hey everyone, today I'm delighted to be joined with Kevin Derrick, who is the director of such documentaries as Empty Hand, The Real Karate Kids, The Real Miyagi, and the more recently released More Than Miyagi, The Pat Morita Story. So first and foremost, Kevin, thank you very much for taking the time and jumping on with me today. No problem. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's funny, all the, the documentaries that you mentioned, they're all karate related. <laughs> well, that, that was going to be one of my points later on, because uh, I was going to ask what your uh, inspiration for this was. But I can already tell, you know, lifelong Karate Kid fan. So this was definitely a passion project for you. Uh, right. And I want to say congratulations on the documentary as well. Um, I know that it's been getting incredible praise so far, right. great reviews across the board. And right. um, it was actually quite a... Um, a good time for us on the channel as well because over the months of december into january we were covering all of the karate kid films and then into cobra kai season three so this is almost right. when we saw this we immediately wanted to try and get a screener for this thing and and thankfully we were able to be granted one but it's kind of like a nice little epilogue the pat marita story to kind of close off those last couple right, of months. right it just happened all by accident the timing i mean we've been working on this since 2016 and it we wanted to get it out earlier it's just we kept you know confronted by different things and so mm -hmm. it's just just happened to be that it just came out like two weeks after cobra kai came out so it worked out perfectly you know? yeah and i think there's a lot of things in there as well um which i'm sure we'll cover later on in the interview but have been particularly impactful for me so um i've always loved pat marita but like i'm sure many people have said to you my only experience with pat marita and my knowledge of him was through the Karate Kid films, right? Um, I was a big Happy Days fan as well, and I did watch a few reruns, but I never saw an episode with Pat Morita in there, so that was kind of nice to see in the documentary as well, um, and to shed, you know, this uh, the true life story, the tragic story of him as well. But um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, and it was at the end of the credits, it's when you're on camera at the end of the credits, and you said that, um, well, first and foremost, I want to know how you got to meet Pat. I think you mentioned something in 1983 when you first Correct. got to meet him. Right. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I've been in karate all my life, and uh, my karate teacher is Fumi Dimmer. He's the one who did all the stunts for Pat Morita, did you know all the Karate Kids and O'Hara series. So he would have like yearly tournaments. And every year in, in his tournaments, you would see Chuck Norris or you would see Bob Wall, the guy from Enter the Dragon. You would see mm -hmm. people in, from James Bond. And this one year, 1983, it was Pat Morita. I only had known him from Happy Days. The Karate Kid hadn't been out, so I, don't, I didn't know anything about Karate Kid. So he was sitting next to my uh, sensei and they were just talking. And next to Pat Morita was an empty seat. So I just went over there and sat down right next to him. I mean, he was, I was only 15 years old. I didn't know mm -hmm. any better, but you know, he was so nice. He just, you know, started talking to me and we talked about happy days and stuff like that. And then my brother was next to me and he had one of those 30, 35 millimeter cameras. So he grabbed a picture and basically that was my only encounter with Pat. I didn't meet him anytime after that. And that, that, that was basically it. And who would have known like 30 years later, right. I was <laughs> making a story on his life. So it's kind of strange how things are happening. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems like it was fated, like it was meant to be when you look back on it at that sort of fateful yeah. meeting with right. him right there. Um, right, right. I guess you've kind of answered my next question because I was going to say, uh, what was your initial inspiration to want to make this documentary on the life of Pat Morita? Was it recalling memories of meeting him or 
Um, Because clearly, as you mentioned, like your previous documentaries you've made have all been around karate with links to the Karate Kid. So did it just kind of manifest naturally or was it always a passion project that you wanted to you wanted to tell a story? Right. I love karate and I love making films. So anytime I can combine those two passions together, it's like a dream come true for me. So the way this happened is when we were doing the real Miyagi about Sensei Demura, we went and interviewed Pat Morita's wife in Vegas. And uh, we interviewed her in a, in a sushi restaurant. While we were eating, she said she was talking about how, you know, Pat saw his father get hit by a car, the tuberculosis internment camps and all these different things. And it just kind of stuck with me. And then we finished the documentary. Uh, we uh, uh, Netflix bought it. So she watched it on Netflix and then she called us up. I love, she said, I love how you incorporated Pat in there. Oh, it was so emotional for me and all that stuff. So basically that's when it popped in my head. I said, let me ask her the question. Hey, do you want to do a documentary on Pat? (laughs) So, but she wanted to do a um, narrative feature. She didn't want to do a documentary at first. And I told her, well, you know, to do a narrative, you need a couple million dollars and it's going to be hard to raise that money in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do a documentary first and see what kind of, publicity generates and then it'll be easier for us to do the the feature so basically that's what happened she said sure that sounds good and that was 2016 here we are in 2000 uh, 2021 <laughs> Six years later and it's done so that's how that came to be about i was gonna say production takes a long long time doesn't it uh when you look back at it from the beginning but um it sounds like you had like a very clear vision in your head then. You, you mentioned there that there was sort of like an initial differing of opinion of what it should turn out like. But uh, once you cleared that up with her, was it pretty much the vision was consistent? Um, and what was the decision making process like to know how much of Pat's life to contain? Because this is kind of like no holds barred. This goes into like the very tragic side of him as well, which is often a common theme with most comedians. I think the most um, in recent right. times, Robin Williams, for example, you know, it's on stage they put on this exuberant personality but really there's a lot of pain and and hurt that they're masking right right that's that's very true all comedians have some most comedians have some issues but um darn i forgot what the question was oh sorry it was um the decision making process behind it how much of his story you wanted to cover Right, right. The way I originally wanted to do it was I wanted to interview all these people. I basically went on IMDb and I made a list of all the people we want to, you know, include in there. Oscar, my producing partner, he ended up hitting everybody up and most people, you know, agreed to do it. So I was originally, I wanted to tell his story by people's interviews. I didn't want to show, you know, the clips of audio and all that stuff. But then what I realized is most of these people that we interview, they know them more on a professional level rather than a personal level. And the people who know them at a personal level either had passed away or didn't want to be included in documentaries. So I was stuck. Like in the first 20 minutes, I didn't know how to tell a story. And then I ended up running into, uh, you know, TV legends. And I talked to them and they said, yeah, you can use these audio tapes. But at the same time, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, started out with a lot of audio and pictures and make it look like a montage but i really didn't have a choice so the first 15 minutes was the hardest for me but what i envisioned from the beginning and what i have now are two different things and i think that's common with uh, whoever does uh, documentaries i mean when you do films uh, it's directed three times when you write it when you shoot it and when you edit it but i think for documentaries it's it weighs heavily towards the editing side. So you might have a vision and once you get down to editing it, I think that's like 70% of it. But what happens during the editing process is that the first month when you're editing, everything looks really good. You go, oh my God, this is great. People are gonna love this. And then like six months down the line, you already watched it like, I don't know, Mm -hmm. five (laughs) hundred times before. Hmm, yeah, this, this is not bad. I think people might like it. And then a year later you go, what the heck is this? No one's right. going to- <laughs> so if this is just a common experience that editors go through. So we, I, my first edit that I had was an hour. No, I'm sorry. It was like two hours and 20 minutes or something like that. Mm-hmm. So we had a test screening in 2019 before the whole COVID happened. And I invited a whole bunch of people that I knew and I didn't know just so I can get like a fair 
assessment of what this, you know, what they think. And just by the notes that I got, I was, you know, they made me realize, okay, these stuff that you have in here, you need to get out. It's really not necessary. So basically what I did is in the doc, in the DVD and the Blu-ray, I basically took all those scenes and I put them in there. So whoever is interested in seeing what I took out, everything is there. But yeah, what you vision and what happens at the end is two mm -hmm. different things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to like go back to the pacing that you mentioned. I thought it moved a, a beautiful pace, the, the, the runtime that you got it down now. I would like to see that extra footage. I, I wasn't aware that there was more footage to see. I, well, I gathered there probably was with condensing everything down that you have to do with editing. But uh, no, that's really cool. And I like your approach to the documentary as well in that by reaching out to so many people, you can kind of map from everyone's different perspective of the guy. You can get an image from him based on everyone's anecdotes and stories about him. And I, I absolutely love that approach to the documentary. Um, and I guess you did kind of answer my next question as well. I was going to say, how easy was it to reach out to the actors to feature in this documentary? But it sounded like, w was that easy? It sounded like, was it just throw a couple of emails together and you got everyone on board? Well, no, it wasn't that easy. Some people we had to go through, because sometimes when you send an email to an agent, the agent is really looking out for some other kind of interest, but you have to find the right person that makes sure that the actor gets a hold of that email. So we tried mm -hmm. different things, you know, the publicists, the managers, and then eventually we got to everyone. But the only person, a couple of people that I wanted to do that, that that they couldn't do. One of them was Hillary Swank. Oh, that, you know, yeah. I mean, Next mm -hmm. Cry Kid was her first first movie ever. And I heard a story that before that, she was living in her car with her mother and, you know, she didn't have any money and all that. So I don't know if that's true, but that's what I heard. So I, I, she wanted to do it, but she was doing a Netflix series and she said she's too busy. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do Ron Howard. I wanted to do Ron Howard because... He was the person who also produced the O'Hara series that showed on yeah. ABC, his production company. And then Catherine Keener, uh, O'Hara was her mm -hmm. first television show. Those are the people that I really wanted. But, you know, according to the, you know, they, they couldn't do it then, you know. But majority of the people that I wanted, I think Ralph and, and Zapka were the most important, more crucial to the story. And I'm glad that they participated. You know. Yeah, and I mean, um, there were stories specifically that Ralph was mentioning, which, um, and, and kind of just knowing more about Pat's life from this, like his um, alcoholism and his addiction, because I wasn't aware of any of that stuff before going into the documentary until I saw your trailer, until I saw the documentary. So now as a Karate Kid fan, going back to those films, there are certain scenes, and even in Cobra Kai, that I'm going to have completely just recontextualize opinions on now. The, the scene from the first Karate Kid film, for example, where... Miyagi gets drunk and he's talking about the internment camps. Now, when I watch that, it was already moving in context of the film, but knowing that now that reinforced his performance. And when Ralph, this was particularly moving to me when Ralph mentioned that he felt like he should have reached out to Pat Moore in his life, that he felt a little bit guilty that he never tried to keep in contact with him. And this recent right. series of Cobra Kai, where um, Kamiko reads the letter to him, um, you can tell that again, completely recontextualized, knowing more about Pat's real story. Right, right. He did say that, you know, a year before Pat passing, they were giving Pat Morita a Lifetime Achievement Award in an Asian American Film Festival, something like that. And he said that was the moment for me that I really got to tell him how I felt and I thanked him for everything. So and I think that's on YouTube or somewhere that, you know, mm -hmm. you know watch it but i think yeah, he, he wrote a really nice speech and he said i was happy to be able to tell him all that stuff before you know he passed away mm -hmm. um and then you mentioned there as well about people that you wish you could get but unfortunately couldn't get at the end of the documentary it mentions that um pat marita's daughters um either didn't want to be a part of it or couldn't comment uh can you i don't know how much you can say about that are you able to elaborate on that a bit more because i i felt personally that it would have been nice i know that you probably tried but it would have been nice to have get uh, to get their take on on the man himself. I, I wish they would have, and I, I know I like to get every side of the story, whether it's good or bad. I mean, I don't think anybody else is going to do a documentary on Pat Morita, and I I would have liked them to participate. But you know, we contacted them, and they said, you know, uh, we rather not get involved. 
And, you know, for me, one thing I've experienced doing documentaries is when you get to a point that you have to convince someone to participate. Right. And they do. It turns into something you it just doesn't turn out well. So, you know, I appreciated what they say. We don't want to get involved. I asked them why this is complicated. OK, completely. I understand. I'm not going to ask anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, them, they're very nice people, but, you know, it would have been nice for them to do it. Maybe later on they'll open up and uh, tell us what the reason is, and then we can just do a documentary on them. If they want to do that, I would love to do that. But, you know, for now, we just had to keep them out and because they asked for it, and I didn't really go into detail on on, on them at all. I mean, if, if someone just yeah. to participate, then I can't really show, you know, video footage of them and talk about them and all that stuff. So, you know, I appreciate what they said. So that that's pretty much it. Yeah, I guess in that situation you've got to kind of just respect their privacy around the matter, exactly. haven't you? And you can't yeah. you can't push the issue with that. Yeah. Um one of the big sort of discussion points in the documentary for me, and uh, I actually found this fascinating as a, like a film channel, we review a lot of films but and sort of like trends in Hollywood. Uh, was the discussion on the Asian American actors and the stereotypes in Hollywood history, uh, especially going back to certain scenes from like Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is a film that I still haven't seen, but my God, um, so, Jesus. Um, <laughs> but um, as the production on the documentary developed, did that aspect of the documentary become more of a focal point than you originally intended based on the interviews you got, such as, um, you know, like Hollywood legend James Hong? Um, did it kind did it, that kind of go into that area more than you intended? Well, yeah, Mr. Hong had a really deep experience with, you know, because he started back in the 40s and he had a lot more to say and he did say a lot of stuff. But what happened, it was one of a couple of the scenes that I ended up taking out, but I really didn't want to. But, you know, when you tell a story, it has to revolve around the main character. But yeah. what he was saying is more personal experiences that happened to him. So unfortunately I had to take it out. You know, Hollywood is like that with any minorities. I mean, look at uh, the American Indians, look at the blacks, yeah. look at the Eastern. So everyone gets their turn. You just have to wait. So, I <laughs> so you just have to deal with it. I mean, it's unfortunate that that happens, but you know, I, I look at the Oscars right now, after 90 years, they changed their uh, rules that a certain yeah. percentage of uh, uh, actors have to be minorities and it has to be positive role. So, you know, that's a start. So let's see where it goes from there. Yeah. And it was, it, it did really sort of, it was an eye opening experience to me. He mentioned recent films like Dr. Strange and Ghost in the Shell. And I was like, oh but the one thing that kind of threw me and, and I don't think it's done in like a horrible or offensive way in Karate Kid, but James made a point where he said, um, even the character of Mr. Miyagi in a way is kind of like a stereotype of the wise old uh, karate sage master. And I was like, Oh my God. Yeah, he's right. But I don't think it's done in a horrible way in the karate kid films, but nevertheless, it was, it was an interesting point and um, sort exactly. of take away from that film that I've never had before. Right. Right. I mean, it, that role was a positive for Asians, but yeah, as you said, look into it and it's the same thing. Here's an Asian and this yeah. point. <laughs> But, you know, Robert Mark came in as a nice guy. Uh, you know, he wrote a very nice script. And the overall film was, was you know, delightful. But, you know, mm -hmm. you can't make a perfect film. So, Absolutely. Um, now, I, I just mentioned, like, an eye-opening moment um, for me about the documentary. And there were so many moments in the documentary, especially his childhood uh, and what he had to go through, um, Pat Morita. So my question to you is, um, was what was the most eye-opening aspect of making this documentary to you? And um, what was your biggest takeaway from it through throughout the whole process of learning more about him? You know, I, I knew a lot about his uh, history. I, I read up on him. and But don't, I mean... I, there are a couple of articles that even Ali Marita, I think she wrote an article somewhere about talking about this alcoholism and stuff. But yeah, I didn't know how severe his alcohol problem was. That was the only surprise to me. And when he drank what he did, um, that's why I was very careful in telling the last part, the last half an hour. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, he did actually do what he did on mm -hmm. half days. So I had to confirm it with four people and, but there were other stuff, but I didn't want to include it in there because it seemed to me just coming from one person and it's, I don't like doing one sided, you know, stories. So to me, yeah, to me, it was his alcoholism. And when I talked to the assistant, she, I mean, it's on, it's in the film that she said, you know, 
he was drunk basically every day. He would take uh, vodka and put it in his coffee. So can you imagine now going back and watching The Karate Kid or watching right. any other film? He was drunk the whole time. But what you see on screen, he was, he was drunk. And it was amazing. He was able to, to hide it. He was a functioning alcoholic. And, you know, no one really knew when I talked to the, the Karate Kid cast, no one really knew that he was drunk the whole time. Maybe he did it in his trailer and then he yeah. covered it up and came outside. Or maybe they just knew but didn't want to say anything. I don't know. But, yeah, that was that was the surprise to me. But, you know, in the internment camps, he started drinking when he was 12 years old. His dad and his uncle were making bootleg sake at the internment camp and keeping everybody wasted, from what I hear. Yeah. And, you know, going what uh, – it's justifiable to me that he's drinking. I mean, if you consider all the stuff that he went through, I would have probably been doing something worse than alcohol. Yeah, no, you know? absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, but you, he was a very humble, nice person. He donated his time to Shriners Hospital helping kids. So I didn't want to take away and focus too much on his, you know, drinking problem. I wanted to, you know, show the kind of person that he was. I think at the end of the film... It's justifiable why he was drinking, and at the same time, you feel for him. So it's not, I'm not trying to diminish his character. That's the last thing that I want to do. But, you know, I just didn't want people to remember him as an addict. Yeah, no, and absolutely. I think you you achieved it very tactfully and got everything across that you needed to. You still, you know, you painted a wonderful picture of it uh, with all the footage and everything you had to work with. Uh, and I don't think it's done in any kind of mean-spirited way. In fact, I think it's kind of a, a celebration and look back on everything that that man was able to achieve from everything he went through from his childhood to receiving an Oscar nomination, like going for, you know, but it, it covers it all. It covers the highest highs and the lowest lows. And I think that was the best way to go about it. Um, so I think, uh, we've covered everything that I've got written down at least, but, um, before we sign off, um, if you want to tell people where they can find more than Miyagi, uh, the Pat Morita story, uh, where they can buy it or where it's available. Right. I, I would say the best thing is if you go on our website, www.morethanmiyagi.com, we have listed everything where it's available, iTunes for, uh, Amazon, the people who uh, are live in other countries that can access iTunes and Amazon, they can go on Vimeo and everyone can rent it. And we're working on some other platforms too, like Voodoo, Redbox, and cable like Cox, Comcast, and all that. So, so that's going to be coming out soon. That's going to be accessible to like everyone. So awesome. Um, so I've seen that also. It's on um, Amazon Prime Video, I think, as well. It's like £3.49 for people in the UK. I know a lot of people are going to be picking this up as well and giving it a watch based on our reviews and our recommendations. So uh, once again, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time with me today and chatting with me about this and uh, all the best for the future and your future projects as well. So thank, thank you very much, man. Appreciate okay. it. Take thank care, you so man. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. That entire chapter of my life changed me forever. So that was all the time that I had with Kevin Derrick, but I had a great time interviewing him and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Uh, obviously, please go and pick up or rent a copy of More Than Miyagi, the Pat Morita story. Uh, it's a fantastic documentary and I thoroughly recommend people watching it, especially if you are a fan of his work, the Karate Kid films, or you want to know more about the guy himself. Um, I'd absolutely thoroughly recommend it. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give us a like and comment as well. And be sure to subscribe to our channel. Uh, we have a lot of content coming out recently. And also you can follow us on our social medias too. That's Facebook at Cinema Savvy, Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy. We're back on Letterboxd now as well with Letterboxd. Um, if you just go on there, it's dot com slash Cinema Savvy. And also we have a tea public link in the description down below where you can pick up some of our merch too. So that'll do it for the video today. Hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you on the next video. Take care, everyone.